Good evening, folks. I'm Tim Mendes. This is my 12th live reading. Um, tonight, I'm going to be giving you a story from the Gypsum Sound Tales. Um, <laughs> I call it an anthology because it's more like an anthology, but it's actually part of a regular publication called Colp. But this issue was uh, called Black and Grey. And it's all it's all on based on tattoos, like all the stories are about tattoos. It's really kind of cool. Uh, I'll tell you more about that later and some links of how to buy it. There should be a link below that you can click if you want it. Um, tonight's story is called Mr. Mannequin. And it opens with a quote by the master himself, H.P. Lovecraft. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. Detective Constable Richards' fingers itched as he turned the printed pages of the autopsy report. What he read didn't add up. Nothing about this case added up. From the moment the body washed up on the beach, it had been a complete enigma. Richards had been on the force for a number of years, but he had never once heard of a completely unidentifiable body. Not in this day and age. No dental records checked out. There were no fingerprint, no DNA or fingerprint matches. And the cadaver was completely naked and entirely hairless. The only distinguishing marks were the tattoos. There was lots and lots of tattoos. A local man, Sam Potts, was taking his poodle on its morning excursion around the bay. He was gazing at the beautiful sunrise when little Timmy started to yap. Hurriedly, Sam went to investigate what his loyal companion had found. Lying on the waterline was what looked like a mannequin that somebody had used to design tattoos. The entire body, from head to foot, was covered in elaborate lines and walls. As he neared the mannequin, it soon became horrifically clear that it was the corpse of a man. It had real eyes, genitals, and a mouth that gaped open at the sky, twisted in apparent agony. Sam fumbled his mobile phone into the sand. While he was retrieving it, he decided that he should check for a pulse. He had heard tales of dead-looking people not actually being dead. It will come as no great surprise that there wasn't a pulse. Finally, he called the Bettles Co. Constabulary. Richards hadn't been in CID long. He had pushed for it and pushed for it, and finally he was seconded. This was his first major case in his new role, and it was shaping up to be a puzzler, so he took the files home for a perusal. Sweat beaded on his clammy forehead as he stared at the preliminary doctor's notes, hoping, praying, that some fine, tiny detail would leap out and provide an answer to his problem. Something strange was going on, and that was a gross understatement. The body had been in the sea for some time, but there was no sign of adipose slippage or the hungry nibbling of crabs and other marine scavengers. This in itself was bewildering. Surely, to a crab, a human cadaver would be like an all-you-can-eat buffet. But the body was pristine, white as alabaster and smooth as porcelain. The meat had hardened, almost petrified. And then there were the tattoos. Richard spread pictures out on his desk and poured a large scotch. He hoped the delightfully burning liquid would help steady his trembling hands. He didn't usually take his work home, but this case was special. His superior, Detective Sergeant Finch, had given him the task of identifying the deceased, and he wasn't about to let him down. The designs were strange. Some of the walls looked tribal, possibly Polynesian or Maori. But it was the more detailed pieces that sent the shivers racing up and down his spine like the fingers of an icy mistress. The symbols were seemingly occult, but subscribed to none of the usual pentagrams and goat-headed demons he usually associated with Satanists. No, these seemed to tell a kind of story, linked by the lines and patterns. Some looked like an odd runic language, 
It was almost like Stone Age cave art. Richard fired up a cigarette and inhaled deeply. He closed his eyes to savour the rush of nicotine entering his system. Pops and flashes of colour danced on his eyelids. Then a flash, a mighty roar in his ears, and the sensation of falling and drifting. The harsh trill of his mobile phone snapped him out of his strange reverie. After rubbing his eyes and gripping the table to steady his trembling body, Richards picked up the phone. The voice on the other end was unmistakable. The gravelly Cornish burr of Detective Sergeant Finch greeted him sharply. We've just found another mannequin. Finch sounded grave, almost worried. This alarmed Richards, as the man mounting was usually unflappable. I'll pick you up in half an hour. OK, boss, are we ready? Richards replied. Do we have an ID on the body this time? Not yet. It's only been radioed through. I'll speak to you soon. The news was like a hammer blow. Richards' vision blurred and went sideways. How can there be another one of these? The strangely painted mannequins. He gulped back the scotch and tried to get his thoughts in order. He was still dressed in his ill-fitting suit, so all he had to do was wait. His eyes danced over the pictures and the blood started to roar in his ears once again. He screwed his eyes tight and shook his head. Indian ink is usually what is used in tattoos. Richards picked up the part of the report that detailed a distinctive body art. Indian ink, not squid ink. He looked at the line over and over, hoping that it would change. He had never before heard of cephalopod ink being used in tattooing, let alone ink from an unknown type of cephalopod. At least the pathology lab was as clueless and bewildered as he was. Thirty minutes could seem like an eternity when dread is chewing at your intestines. Richards nervously paced the room, listening to the ferocious rain hammer the old sash windows. He must have been leaning on his right elbow awkwardly, as numbness began to spread down the side and into his ring and little fingers. He shook them to get the blood going again. A sharp blast from a car horn announced that Finch had arrived. After Finch had described how the body had been found by a drunken teenager taking a slash behind the shops, he and Richards took the rest of the journey in silence. Rain pel pelted the window shield as the wonky wipers on the battered Ford Focus struggled to keep visibility clear. Finch wore a grave expression and Richards could see the hamster running in its brain wheel as he pondered the unsettling notion of a truly bizarre serial killer. The corpse lay in between two large recycling bins. It appeared to be totally hairless and white. Tattoos of a similar strange design covered the visible portions of the cadaver. But here lay the main difference between the two bodies. This one was fully clothed. Richards instantly recognised the corduroy trousers, stout boots and raincoat. They belonged to Sam Potts. He even clutched the dog lead tightly in his right hand, though little Timmy was nowhere to be seen. Richards's stomach twisted into a tight knot, bile bubbled in his gullet. The implication was just too odd to compute. In the 12 or so hours since he had discovered the body on the beach, Sam had all his body hair removed, his skin bleached and then covered in squid ink tattoos. Grabbing one of the bins for support, Richards threw up a rancid combination of cheap scotch and police canteen sausage sandwiches. Blimey, you all right, kid? The ferret friendly bear, Detective Sergeant Fitch, Finch asked. Yeah. Richards wiped his mouth on the sleeve of his jacket. Sorry, sir. Just a bit under the weather. Think I've got a touch of the lurgy, he lied. Well, next time you need to lose your lunch, try not to do it on the crime scene, all right? Finch smiled. He was only half joking. Sorry, sir. Richard straightened up and leaned against one of the bins. It's Sam Potts, sir. Yeah, I know. Finch stared at the body in bewilderment. 
I just don't see how it's possible. At that moment, a flash of white light alerted the burly detective to another immediate problem. Bastard! Finch fumed. I swear, when I find out who told the press, I'll string him up by his left nut. Finch bellowed at a young copper in uniform to seize the camera and detain the interloper. I'll get onto HQ to give me a list of all registered tattooists. You see what you can get from Socko, then pl get Plod to drive you home. Get some rest. It's going to be a bugger of a day tomorrow. With that, Finch clapped Richards on the shoulder and stormed off across the street, wearing an expression that brought to mind a particularly murderous walrus. The only thing D.S. Finch hated more than an unsolved murder was the press. Sleep didn't come easily that night. Richard stared at the ceiling for what seemed like an eternity. The inky patterns from Mr. Mannequin's body danced over the flaking plaster. They started as a psychedelic display, then shifted into something more coherent, more visual, like an old black and white newsreel of some distant race memory. Figures cavorted and changed, danced and morphed. The progeny of the first pools of primordial slime evolved from protoplasm to ape to man. And all guided by this omnipotent force, some strange cosmic leviathan older than time itself, godlike and indifferent. It was all just one big science experiment. Richards had the sensation of falling as sleep took hold. His airways filled with stinging salt and his lungs ballooned with water. He began hurtling through the murky depths, bleached coral snagging at his pyjamas like ghostly spiders. Scuttling scavengers continued their life or death struggles in the harsh dying landscape. From out of a deep hollow came tentacles. He slowed down and circled the opening. A beautifully coloured and marked cephalopod emerged from the hole and embraced him tightly. The creature was unlike any squid, octopus or cuttlefish he had ever seen. She was huge, and like an amalgamation of the three spe species, along with something vaguely humanoid and bat-like. Purple in colour with elaborate markings that closely resembled the designs on both mannequin corpses. As they embraced, a feeling of serenity flooded his body. He felt warm and safe, his body tingling with every soft touch of her tentacles. He was in the presence of royalty. She was his empress, and he was content to be consumed by her. He could feel his body slipping away, dissolving into plankton and krill. Then a sharp buzzing brought his consciousness rushing back towards the surface. The alarm grated harshly in Richards' ears. His, alarm fla his arm flailed at the bedside table as he tried to silence the klaxon. His body felt strange. The control that is taken for granted by humanity seemed to be somehow missing, as though his fine motor skills were wrapped in cotton wool. He was clammy with sweat, and his arms and legs tingled. After a couple of minutes just lying in silent meditation, he opened his eyes. Terror punched him in the gut as he noticed that his right arm was covered in the str same strange designs as both Sam and the unknown cadaver. To make matters more soul-wrenching, they were spreading, creeping slowly up his arm and slithering across his now completely hairless torso. Richard sat bolt upright and wailed in despair. His once full head of short black hair had stayed on the pillow. Every strand of body hair had been ejected from its follicles. His skin had a waxy, almost rubbery quality. As he tried to stand, his legs buckled and swayed. Propping himself upright on the stout bookcase that housed his extensive collection of true crime books, he tried to get his thoughts in order. The creature from his dream had somehow imparted knowledge to him. It was a handshake that had brought him to his current predicament. Touch. That was how it spread, like a virus. It jumped from body 
to body. Sam was chosen when he checked for a pulse. In turn, Richards was chosen when he shook Sam's hand after the interview. Richards prayed for humanity that he hadn't made... <sighs> Richards prayed to whatever would listen that he hadn't made skin top contact with anybody else and that those who examined the bodies wore gloves. Richards wobbled over to the table and sat himself down. The tattoos had spread down his leg and now covered his right hand side. He needed to warn people of the doom that was consuming him. Picking up his mobile phone, he saw that he had received a late night text from DS Finch. It informed him simply that the apparent cause of death was the same in both cases. There was no heart. The pathologist could find no visible cause of death in Mr. Mannequin. There were no lacerations, puncture wounds, smashes, breaks or ligature marks. The lungs were free of water and the brain was undamaged. The only thing he could find was that the body had no heart. It was a mystery. There were no signs of how the heart was removed. It was just simply gone. His body was almost totally numb as he babbled an incoherent message on DS Finch's voicemail. He tried to articulate the danger of the squid ink. It was her ink, that majestic deep sea empress that had ensnared his soul. Reality and dream were beginning to morph in his head. He staggered over to the bed and collapsed. Time lost all meaning as his eyes rolled in his head. Faint echoes of banging on his door and DS Finch bellowing for him to open up drifted through the dense sea fog in his mind. It wasn't going to be long before he returned to the depths and gave his empress, Cthulhu, the hidden one, his heart. The end. Thank you. Uh, that was Mr. Mannequin. Um, if you got it, I didn't say it beforehand because I forgot. Uh, uh, if you want have any questions, get them down in the comments section now. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about that that story and about the publication. That is in Culp Black and Grey from Gypsum Sound Tales. Uh, you can pick that up by going getbook at forward slash Culp Big B. N big G. Okay, again, that should be down underneath somewhere. That you know should be easy to find. Uh, like I said, this anthology is all about tattoos, hence black and grey. Um, it's got some really good writers in it uh, and all the rest of it, but it's also got a cool bit at the back where um, instead of author pictures next to the bios, they've gone for author tats, and there's some uh, some interesting ones there. I mean, look, there's there's mine uh, and various other bits and pieces yeah that came about that story came about when I saw it that was one I actually specifically wrote for that publication I saw the the sub come up on one of the, the one of the things I used to give to find subs <clears throat> and when it said it was uh, tattoo based my first thought you know predictably was ooh, squid ink uh i originally was i was originally going to write that as a cthulhu story uh and it was originally going to be a female police officer but i i like to use the lesser used mythos deities i mean uh, i like to i mean i use like cthulhu and ithaca and tasogua and uh, act like Naka and all, all these ones that have not been used that often. And I thought, oh, what if I thought, because originally it was going to be Cthulhu. And I thought as soon as it said unknown cephalopod, everybody's going to think, oh, Cthulhu. But I thought I'd throw a curveball uh, and have it as Cthulhu's daughter. Uh, yeah, the hidden one, Cthulhu. Uh, yeah, he's used by Lynn Carter and people like that. Uh, yeah, one of, it, one of his star spawn progeny. Uh, yeah. It was, it was simple as that. And it, it was one of the ones that wrote itself really quite easily. Uh, I'm quite pleased with that story. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, Jacqueline Moran Meyer says, uh, Little Timmy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't actually think that I was naming it after myself when I when I wrote that. It was only reading that back and was like, oh, come on. <laughs> Hello, David. <laughs> KT Tate waves tent waves tentacles. <laughs> uh, Helga waves tentacles back. Yeah, this is Helga, my squid. Yeah, she's awesome. Oh, that was though. She was another influence because as soon as I started thinking about female octopod deities, she had to be purple. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. Uh, yeah, props. Oh, yeah, I always like to get the props in there. <laughs> it's a. Uh, I've done some ridiculous ones over the time. I, I think my favourite was when I did Fruits de Mer, and it was about killer oysters, and I actually made a killer oyster out of scallop shells and gaffer tape. I got all blue Peter on it. Yes, aha, uh -huh. I'm glad, I'm, yeah, I'm glad you spotted that. Katie Tate um, says it, yeah, oh, a love story. It was, yeah. That's the closest anything I've ever written has got to romance. <laughs> it's just a, a genre I can't do. I, I, I can't do it with any kind of reality. Yeah. You know, the, the odd time I've tried it, it ends up coming across like something you'd find in the, the letters in the Sunday sport or something, you know. Yeah, just not good. Some people can write that kind of thing. I can't. <laughs> but yeah, see, I thought it was a love story as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Helga's awesome, isn't she? There you go. You see, you've got fans, Helga. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, glad you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much. Cool. That looks like all for now. Um, well, again, thank you for joining me. Uh, once again, you can pick that up at getbook.at, Culp, Big B, N, Big G. I have some uh, other links. Now, check out my, my website. It keeps up to date. And there's also like sections with all the videos, the, my bibliography and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, that's timmendyswriter.wordpress.com. And all of my previous 11 live videos are up on my YouTube channel, along with some interviews and other stuff like that. I mean, I'm going to be doing and filming another episode of my After Hours series in about an hour. Uh, you can pick all that up on tinyurl.com. Uh, yeah, hold it near the camera. Forward slash Tim Mendes YouTube, all one word, all lowercase. That's tinyurl.com forward slash Tim Mendes YouTube. Oh, uh, just before I go, um, Jacqueline has a question. Uh, it's the older plotter or pantser debate, isn't it? Uh, how do I write my stories? Do I write ideas or plan? I tend to get ideas and I'll write them in a book. And then when something comes up, I'll just write it. I'm a complete pantser. I don't I don't plot things out. I I can't. If I did that kind of thing, I'd never actually write anything. I'd still <laughs> I'd still be plotting this out a year later. You know, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a complete and total pantser. I just. I tend to write in an almost stream of consciousness kind of style, whereas I'll start with an idea and just keep going. And if things what if things come in that I think are a good idea, I might follow that tangle, that tangent or. Yeah, I, I just just go and then you can always that's the beauty of mod, modern technology, isn't it? It's not the same as when you're writing everything on a typewriter. You can just cut it if it ain't good, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, Jennifer, yeah. yeah. Another pantser there. Yeah, <laughs> pantsers and proud. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jacqueline's the same. Yeah. I know David is uh, is also pretty much a pantser. He's more of a plotter than I am, but uh, cool. Well, thank you for your questions and thank you for your cool comments. Thank you for watching. Remember to share and like and all that kind of stuff. And I'll see you again soon. All right. Good night.